thank you so much for being here. As promised, you're going to give a quick talk, and then I'm going to ask you some of those questions that the whole audience have been asking me to ask you. So I'm going to wait here, and then uh, we'll chat afterwards. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Tabitha. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here. A fantastic start to London Tech Week, my first event of the week, a first event of many, because it's an important moment to uh, celebrate the impact of technology and the chance to understand and for us policymakers to grip what makes this city and this country such a great place to invest in tech. I appreciate that I will be speaking about what I see as the big picture uh, challenges, but I was thinking of doing this in a, um, uh, 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 on the time frame of a year or maybe a decade, um, not of um, a few billion years. Um, so I hope I don't um, disappoint in scope. Um, but the truth is this, that from the first uh, diode to Turing's pioneering computers and to the World Wide Web, the UK has been at the heart of some of the world's most important tech innovations. And the UK is now a digital dynamo, and it's a nation of pioneers striving to lead the world in technology and the tech that is transforming the world. And this is our moment to celebrate that and to take stock of the progress that we've seen. I just want to read out a few crucial statistics, because I think it's important, given what's happening in the world, to take stock of where we are. First thing is, last year, UK venture capital investment exceeded Germany, France, and Sweden combined. We have the third highest global investment in tech after the USA and China. And a few weeks ago, London was once again ranked as the leading tech hub in Europe. So this isn't just about talking tech. This progress has been fueled by a huge program of work and support over many years. We've already become the natural destination for the largest, most innovative companies to operate and invest in in Europe. Uh, Apple, Apple, Amazon, Google, IBM, many more have bases in the UK and are expanding them or will soon be setting them up. And these big companies thrive because it is alongside a rich and diverse ecosystem of startups and scale-ups, transforming our economy right across different sectors. And if you think about it, all the way from um, fintech to medtech to edtech and across the board, there are subsectors now that are growing strongly, especially because of the benefits in London of having so many different sectors together here in one city. But we know that we cannot rest on our laurels and we need to keep moving forward. We have some of the best minds, some of the best companies, some of the best universities in the world, and we have strong conditions for tech. But we know that we need to do more. So last month, we launched a billion pound deal to make sure we stay in the first rank of artificial in intelligence economies, for instance. We're investing further billions in the infrastructure, like full fiber and 5G, and we're putting talent at the heart of the education system. Digital skills, for instance, like making coding compulsory at school and funding more PhD places for AI right across the spectrum, ensuring that our domestic uh, skill base is strengthened. And we also want the world to increasingly see what we know here that we offer the talent, the ambition, the research, the environment to develop artificial intelligence and change lives for the better. Now, this is a big priority of mine, making tech work for everyone. It's not about stifling innovation in tech, far from it. It's about creating the right conditions for technology to flourish and make sure it flourishes in a way that works for everyone. Take gender diversity, for example. We've got so many advocates in this room today for women in tech who demonstrate on a daily basis what you can do. Tabitha, Wendy Hall, I see Joanna Shields here, many, many more. Thank you for your work. I share your passion on this important agenda because it's not just about getting things right. It's also that if you don't pursue gender diversity, then you're only fishing from half the pond. And diversity in tech isn't a moral, just a moral imperative, it's good business sense too. 
Businesses that understand their customers and communities and give them what they want will be those that thrive, especially in competitive and fast-moving industries like AI. So it's in everyone's interests to have a tech industry that reflects the communities and customers that they serve. So for instance, I hope you sign up to the Tech Talent Charter. If you haven't yet, then you should. We have in government, it brings together public, private, charitable sectors to make sure we've got diversity of thought, diversity of thought, and access the skills and the talent that we need for Britain to remain a tech world leader. Since we signed up to the Tech Talent Charter, every government department has followed DCMS's lead and committed to joining. So we're filling the thousands of digital data and technology roles across government to be more reflective of the country that we serve. So making sure we have diversity is good for business and it's good to make sure that technology works for everyone. A second area, of course, where this is critical is putting the right ethical frameworks in to create the laws and the norms that will shape the future, especially of the cross-cutting technologies like artificial intelligence. We've all seen the stories of the AI chatbots who've become racist or sexist due to learning from the environment around them. We need to work hard to make sure technology can best harness the best of humanity rather than amplify the worst. We recently announced our Center for Data Ethics and Innovation. This is a government body to provide the leadership needed in this area. It'll be a world-class advisory body and make sure data and AI delivers the best possible outcomes for society. It will not be a regulator, but its job will be to set standards and to lead the public debate to make sure that we get the best of innovation and that it is done with ethical underpinnings and strong architecture. And I want everybody in this room, I want everybody interested in the future of technology and AI in Britain to join this conversation. And we'll very, very shortly be launching a consultation on the roles, on the center's role and its objectives and its activities. And I hope that you will all get engaged to make sure that we shape plans for this innovative future where ethical considerations are core and central and allow for the innovative use of data that we all know can change so many lives for the better. So there's a lot of work to do to get this right, to make sure that the technology works for everyone. But ultimately, let me say this. Let us use the transforming power of technology to solve problems, to support enterprise, to enhance freedom and opportunity across the world because this is what this technology in our hands has the power to do, to shape our economy and our society for the better. And here in the UK, we're a nation that is straining every sinew to create the right environment because we get tech and we'll be supporting our digital dynamos every step of the way. Thank you very much. much, Matt. I, um, I'm really glad that you've got here. I hear um, that it's your son's birthday this morning. And Matt today um, turned down seeing David Beckham for his son's birthday, but he still raced here for us. Because clearly, tech is the, I mean, I had to clap that. Um, it's about priorities, Tabitha. It is. And, uh, thank you. Um, I also hear that you, uh, you're actually walking your own talk. Uh, has, any, has everyone heard of the Matt Hancock app? I'm a Suffolk constituent, so I use the Matt Hancock app. I didn't pay Tabitha to mention it. I, I actually do use the Matt Hancock app, and I hear that you're, you're putting some AI in the Matt Hancock app? Uh, yes, it's true. It's true. The, um, uh, I brought in the Matt Hancock app because under GDPR, you might have heard of GDPR, you might have got an email about it. Um, the, um, <laughs> under GDPR, there's a requirement for, the, for social media platforms to make it easy to transfer your data to a different app to try to make the platforms more contestable, which is one way of challenging um, the, the scale um, issues. And um, of course, this means that loads of people have been transferring all their data and, uh, and now using the Matt Hancock app as their primary social media site. Um, and um, <laughs> it's great to meet one occasionally. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, so, but I've also actively chosen to make this, uh, make the app um, a pleasant place to be. Mm. Partly to demonstrate that this is possible. Partly because I want to, I want technology to be 
the solution to some of the challenges that tech has thrown up, uh, not seen just as part of the problem. Um, and um, I think this is a wonderful piece of AI. It was developed by Jigsaw, which is Google's um, 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 uh, lab. lab, sort of philanthropic uh, lab, trying to use technology to solve um, challenges. And they, br they built in a piece of AI which shows to a moderator of a site on a scale to 1 to 100 how offensive a piece of language is. Um, it's a really simple concept, quite hard to do, but uh, Google have done a great job of it. And we've embedded this AI so that if anybody says something uh, unpleasant, it gets highlighted to my moderators and I can kick people off okay. the site. And the result is, it's a really cheerful place to be. Yeah. Well done. How do we get the rest of the government to be using some more AI? You talk, um, you talk, and, and the PM in the grand challenges talks about these ambitious and stretching goals. Um, and what I was really thrilled to hear uh, the day that the grand challenges were launched was um, that success is not guaranteed. And I think um, hearing MPs say the success is not guaranteed and hearing the PM say that was quite refreshing for us as an industry who really understand that. Yeah. How, how do you think you'll be able to go about, about that? Well, I want to see um, uh, both in the private sector and in the public sector, I want to see more freedom to fail. And let me say what I mean about that. I, I mean by that that um, anybody who's been involved in a startup knows that the freedom to fail is vital to even starting. Yeah. Um, and in government, having been responsible for, the, for driving out the use of digital technology in government, I know that, the, uh, that the, the concerns about the risk appetite are often a big reason why things move slowly. And the sad irony is that normally the concerns about the risk appetite are higher at the sort of mid-ranking level than they are at the top. And so getting from the Prime Minister down the very clear direction that we know that it won't always work, and that is the point of an agile and iterative approach to delivery, whether in whatever sector you're in. Yeah. And when the grand challenges um, were announced, I think us as an industry were really excited. But I followed a lot of the messaging on Twitter, and immediately the first thing people say is, then we're all going to lose our jobs. What's your advice to us as an audience that we should be talking to the general public about when we are promoting this kind of technology? Well, look, we need to reassure people that uh, the, the jobs are being created by this technology. My view, having studied this a huge amount, is that um, the, the, the jobs that are going are going anyway. Mm -hmm. the, the policy question we have, the question we have as a society is, do we get the new jobs here? Do we do what is necessary to ensure that jobs that have been created by technology are jobs that are here in the UK? Um, because the technology is going to be created somewhere, and then people will adopt it, and the jobs will go. And if you try to stand in the way of that, then you know, we've seen from past experience uh, in, in Britain and elsewhere that you just end up losing the jobs anyway. So let's be on the side of the, uh, the, the creators of the new jobs. Now, We've also got to be very careful to ensure that people whose jobs are disrupted are, are, are supported. So digital training, lifelong training, um, and making sure the broad economy is working well. But in a way, the best proof point for this jobs argument is to look at exactly what's happening in Britain today. There are already whole sectors that have been significantly <coughs> disrupted. Uh, and yet we have record numbers of jobs, record proportion of, um, of, of people in employment, um, record number of uh, women in, in employment. Um, the, the labor market is going very strongly. Um, and um, uh, um, we've got to see that continue. Yeah. And you said, that, um, you, you said just now that we need to make sure those jobs are here. At Viva Tech, you said no country will thrive by pulling up the drawbridge and thinking they have all the answers. Um, I think we all hear the word Brexit in the back of our heads when we read that. How, how do you um, make sure that we're not panicking um, or we do the best uh, when, uh, when you're saying that at the same time as we're, we're leaving the EU? Well, I was, I'm a great fan of the Hitchhiker's Di um, uh, Guide to the Galaxy and I, had a, I was tempted um, to um, use its front cover just then as a uh, response. But you know, the truth is this. Um, with the Brexit vote, it is vital that Britain looks out to the whole world and that our response is a global one. You know, at our best, we are open and gregarious and internationalist and engaged with the whole world. I was, I was just talking to um, somebody on the way in who raised an issue about somebody they wanted to employ 
um, and, but not from Europe. You know, we have employed people from right around the world in the past, and we need to make sure that we make good on our commitment to that the brightest and the best from the, around the world are not only allowed to come here, but are welcome here and encouraged. And there, is, there, there should, I want to see a country where there is nowhere better to move to start a tech business. Yeah. And that's because we've got the, um, the environment for enterprise right and the policy around that and the um, SEIS schemes and the, um, and, and the, the broader arrangements for enterprise and make it as easy, easy as possible. Where the ecosystem is strong, everybody talks about an ecosystem. Lots of places around the world have got the fact that it, you need a broad ecosystem. But also that this is a great place to live. You know, one of our biggest selling points is the combination of the language and the cultural life of the nation and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and some days the weather. <laughs> um, but the, the point is that it is a, we've got to make sure that this is a great place to move to where people want to, uh, they want to go and start the London office or start up their business in, in the UK. Well, hopefully, conferences like COGX do help with that. Um, I'm quite sad to say we're going to have to finish, because I could have gone on. I actually had quite a lot more questions. Go on, keep going. Um, but I'm, I'm being, like, cut. So thank you so much. Um, big round of applause. Thank you, Great everybody. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.